I had this feeling of peace come over me when I understood that I was going to die and there was nothing I could do about it. That was it. And when I accepted that, this peace settled on me. And I started thinking about my parents and my missing sister and how I was going to die. My guest today is Peter Panagor, a best-selling author and past keynote speaker at the annual International Association for Near-Death Studies. Peter's had two near-death experiences in his lifetime, and he'll be sharing with us the details of those today. Peter, welcome, and thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you, Rod, way down there in Australia. I'm way up in the Northern Hemisphere here. It's great. Yeah, we were saying before that any time I have a guest on from the States, it means that the future is definitely coming for you because it's Tuesday morning, 8.30, and it's, what is it? 4.30, 5.30 in the uh, afternoon? It's six, 6 30 on Monday, 6.30 in the evening. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? We can do this. Mm, it's crazy. My first question is, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of background about your life up to the day of your first NDE, and then we can go from there. Sure. So I was raised in eastern the United States in the northeast corner outside a city called Boston. I was raised Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic. And my mom and my dad, and I learned very early that the churches hated each other and had for a thousand years and both claimed to hold the truth. And so that was a little confusing. I went to Catholic school. I was a Boy Scout. I was in the ski patrol. I was a bit of a troublemaker, ADHD and dyslexic, but I was dedicated to my interior life by the time I finished high school because when I was a little tiny kid, I had two mystical experiences, one when I was five and one when I was six that set me on a different path. And then when I was in high school, I, and I want to say accidentally, but it's only accidentally, took a triple hit of LSD and had a, an end of duality experience. This is all before my near-death experience. And so that last thing that happened to me was in my senior year of high school. And it just so happened that within a couple of, it transformed me. And just within a couple of months of that, my religion teacher, because I went to Catholic high school, taught centering prayer. At the time, it was called contemplative meditation, has a Theravada Buddhist root to it and a contemplative Catholic root to it. There's a monastery nearby the school that developed this as a response to the 1960s and 70s young people discovering the East and studying meditation. And so they dove into their own roots. And so my senior year of high school, after I had this end of duality experience, I was taught meditation and I dove into it and I stayed with, I still meditate, but it's the meditation that saved me psychologically after my NDE just a few years later. Wow. Okay. I just have a question about the triple hit with the LSD. Were you alone or was there somebody else there when that occurred? <laughs> no, I was, it was some like after second period at the school and I was trying to, I was trying to hurt myself. And I didn't realize that I took this, I, I knew I took three hits, but I had no, it was my first time. I had no idea what I was getting into. Mm. And I had to leave the school for the day. I convinced one of the brothers, it was a Catholic school, I convinced one of the brothers that I was really sick because I'd actually been really sick. I'd been to a clinic the week before with something unrelated that I used as an excuse. And I got the brother to convince the headmaster to let me and a buddy of mine go for the day because I needed to, because the school was a day school and it was like three towns away from where I was and I was in no condition to drive. Mm. So we got out of there pretty quickly and I tripped pretty heavily during the day. And then I had to work that night. I was on the ski patrol at the local hill. It was winter time. And so I had to show up and be on duty. And I, I was skiing with rainbows shooting out of me. And, and it turns out that there was chakra stacked. I didn't know it at the time, but I had this the shockers and the colors, they're all like coming out behind me and as I'm skiing down the slope. And I went off on a side trail and it was evening because it was under the lights. And so I was off on a side trail by myself, freaking out. And suddenly the hill became a rolling wave. The whole hill turned into wave forms and all the trees started swaying and every single thing that there was, the trees, the snow, there was a stone wall that was exposed, the sky, everything was shouting, I am, I exist. But it wasn't, it was like a chorus of a thousand voices coming from the cells of the tree, coming from my own cells. 
I was the same as everything else. And it was all this divine voice that had no sound saying I am and this huge roar. And I understood myself to be the same as everything else. And that was, it was mind blowing. It totally changed me. My nickname at school, it, it, at my Catholic school became Peace Panagore, like that. The next day I'm like, peace man, hey, peace. And, and it was not a compliment. <laughs> So I want to ask you about the musical experiences when you were young, but I think before I do that, I know people want to hear about your near-death experience. So could we fast forward to the when sure. the first one occurred? I was I was I went off to what I do. I went off to university, and then I wanted I went on exchange to another university my junior year. I was at a state school, and I went to another state school in the United States, in Western United States, in the place called Montana which is the Rocky Mountains. And I went there to ski on the ski patrol and to go backpacking and all, oh, yeah, 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 go to school too. And so come spring break, I didn't want to go back home to Boston because my family situation was difficult. My sister had run away when I was 14 and made things very painful at home. So I was staying away from there as much as I could. Long story short, this is a high adventure winter expedition. And I need to let people know that this was not my first winter expedition. The year before I had hiked for 91 miles in March along the Appalachian Trail in Western Massachusetts, which is the state I'm from. And I had grown up as a Boy Scout going winter camping my whole life. And so I had been a backpacker and a camper since I was a toddler, not quite that young, but pretty young we started in my family out into the woods hiking. And so... When spring break came around in 1980, I was 21 years old. I didn't want to go back to Boston. And I was already deep into the high adventure of living out in Montana and in the mountains. So I, I found a partner in the outing club to go on a 10 day ice climbing, snow caving, backcountry skiing trip. And it was his trip. I was looking for something to do. It was his trip. He had this idea. He had just completed his course as, to get certified as a lead ice climber. I'd been cross, I took a class on cross country skiing out there at this mountain. So I was good on my skis and I'd been skiing my whole life downhill. So we went, we compared our skills first and we went into the deep wilderness in the middle of March with about 10 feet of snow on the ground. And we went snow caving. So we skied into this place called Mount Assiniboine in British Columbia. And we lived in snow caves, we dug them out with a shovel and it was great. Well, we had, it was really, it was great, scary a little bit sometimes, but neither of us ever lost our head. We learned about each other. We learned to trust each other and it was fabulous. So we skied back out again and then we were doing this one day ice climb and this one day ice climb, I'd been climbing on rocks with ropes and chalks and carabiners and all this kind of stuff. And I'd done a whole bunch of that, but I'd never done ice climbing before. But Tim was certified and it, there was this internationally famous wall called Lower Weeping Wall, north of Banff, for all you folks who know Western Canada. So it's, a, I don't know, several hours north of Banff and south of Jasper. And it's right on the Icefields Parkway. So it's easy to get to. So we parked in the parking lot, we get all our gear and Tim owned all the gear that he needed. He's from a very wealthy family. He had a, a, the car he was driving was a new car that his dad gave him for going to school. So Tim had all the gear. I had to borrow and find gear that I needed. And I did. I found everything I needed except two hammers. I found one hammer and one ax. And the ax is significantly longer. And when you swing that thing, you can plant that way up high. And then you can let go of it and dangle. There's a strap you can support yourself on. And so you don't have to grip it the whole time. But the hammer is just like a little tiny hammer. And so every time I swung that thing, I got a shorter reach on it and the strap that you, that, so you don't drop it. Cause it wasn't designed to climb the hammers, the hammers really for chipping ice and for putting in ice screws and taking out ice screws, but you can climb with it because it's shaped similarly. And I convinced Tim, we both were nervous about this cause we couldn't, I couldn't come up with two axes and I couldn't afford to buy one. So like, can I do this in all the two weeks leading up to the trip? And we decided that I could do it. And so I did do it. But the problem was that it slowed my climb down significantly, not only because of the reach on the swing, but because of the exertion of having to hold on to it and never being able to relax my forearms. I did switch arms, but I burned out my forearms very quickly because I had to keep holding on. Because in ice, in all climbing, you need three points of contact at all times. So you need either two feet 
and one hand or two hands and one foot. And so three points of contact at all times. So there's always some hand involved. And sometimes it had to be the hammer, half the time probably. All of this meant that by the time we reached the top of the climb, five or 600 feet, the sun was setting and the other teams who had been climbing that day, and there had been a dozen teams other than us who were gone, except for the final team. And they were leaving and they're like looking up at us, 500 feet up going, what are you guys crazy? And but we were stuck. You can't, it's not like hiking when you go on a trail and you're going hiking and like, ah, it's raining and I'm tired. Or the fog came in and, or I got a burr in my shoe or something. You turn around and you go back. You can't do that when you're ice climbing. You've got to go up. You've got to finish the climb so that you can come down on the repels. So we knew halfway up the climb that we were in serious trouble. Part of being in the ski patrol is being trained in wilderness first aid. And so I, I had known that hypothermia and frostbite were a real possibility because at the mountain I was working at, there was this weekend where it was, and I don't know what it is in Celsius, but in Fahrenheit, it was 40 below zero. That's really cold. And we were pulling people off the mountain with frostbite and with hypothermia. And so it was fresh in my head. So we got about halfway up and I, I knew we were in serious trouble, but I could only go as fast as I could go. And Tim knew it too. And he was a very good leader. He didn't pressure me, he just encouraged me and helped me go as quickly as I could. And I did. But by the time we reached the top of the climb, the sun was setting. That last team was leaving, looking at us crazy guys. The sun set, the temperature dropped about 30 degrees like that. The stars came out, 10 million stars of every color you can imagine. And so there was enough light to see by. But immediately we began to have violent shivers and every muscle in my body was independently quaking. So my jaw was clattering, my hands were shaking, my body's twitching all over the place uncontrollably. And we knew that we were in serious, deadly trouble because we're five or 600 feet up. We're in the middle, middle of the wilderness all night long for the, through the entire night, two vehicles went by. And one of them, one of them pulled in, but I'll get to that story, part of the story in a little bit. So it's very isolated. We knew we were on our own and we understood, I, I understood and told Tim that we were going to die. And if we stayed where we were and we talked about snuggling in because in the wilderness, the first thing you do when you get lost or you're in trouble is you stay where you are. You don't keep moving because if you keep moving, they're never going to find you. So you stay where you are, but we couldn't stay where we were because if we snuggled up against the mountain together, tried to use our body heat, we didn't have any body heat and that we were going to die as soon as we stopped moving. So the only thing that was keeping us warm was moving and we had drunk all our water. Fortunately, there was ice, ice chips to suck on, but we had eaten all our food and nobody on none of the teams on the climb that day had brought up gear to spend the night because nobody expected us too, to spend the night. So we were well prepared for the day, except for my ax hammer problem, but we were unprepared for the night. So we decided to press on. And I could tell you the whole story of the warden showing up because we had signed into the log and how our, my eyeballs were freezing and I couldn't move my lips because my lips were frozen and I became cognitively impaired because it makes you make bad choices. Your brain freezes. I had frostbite. All, I have all my digits, but I have problems. I have residual problems my whole life and my hands and my feet, my face and my whole body. It was, imagine we, one of those movies or books where they're climbing in the Himalayas. It's a lower mountain, but all the terrors and the cold, it was like that. And I'll leave out most of the story because you probably want to hear about the, what happened when I died. But I will tell you this about it, is that the hypothermia progressed through the night. We had three repels to go. The hypothermia progressed through the night. And there was this point at which the, well, I should, I should mention that cold feels like fire. So if you ever put your hand on a burner, that's what it feels like. And, and my feet were frozen. My hands were frozen. I'm in pain. My mind, my brain, my drive was survival instinct. And there, there came this point in my night when I felt like I, I drilled with my willpower driving forward to survive, I drilled into this part of my brain that pre-existed my humanity. It was so deep inside me. It was animalistic. I had an animalistic 
desire for survival. It had not nothing to do with language. It had nothing to do with my decision. I was, my body was making me survive. My brain was making me survive. And one of the things, another thing about climbing and being hypothermic is that in climbing, you have to be very intentional about every motion that you make. You have to plan every move because you don't want to expend the extra energy. When you're hypothermic and on a cliff and it's a 500 foot drop, you're very careful about every motion that you make. And so we were being exacting and all of that we could be exacting in as we lost our cognitive ability, as we lost our capacity for making good decisions. And we made a series of bad decisions throughout the night. So cut to the chase. Now we're at the last rappel. We fought our way across the mountain. The moon had risen at some point, And so we had the three quarter moon and we had more light. And we're on a ledge the size of a grand piano. And in the mountain, we're off the ice. There are iron pins epoxied, drilled and epoxied into the mountain with rings, iron rings on them and carabiners and straps and a carabiner. And I was hooked into my harness. So this was the top of the practice repel space. So everybody climb up the face. And then with these harnesses, you could repel back down as good, good in the summertime, good in the wintertime, because this is the first time that we were safe from falling all night. So we're harnessed in here. I'm, I'm clipped in. We're on the ledge. Tim is to my left. It's some time before dawn. My feet were no longer on fire. I lost the feeling in my feet. I was in a state of slow moving determination. And so I took off my gloves and I had the rope and I put my gloves down. I was wearing rag wool mittens with leather chaps, which is something you did in the 1970s, but you would never do now because there was a lot of technology that developed shortly after this happened. So I put my gloves down, I took the end of the rope and I tied it very carefully and slowly to my harness. And then I took the other end of the rope and I tossed it out around the corner. We had turned a corner on, the, on our descent. And I tossed it out around the corner into a dark crag that I couldn't see because it was around the corner. And I pulled on the rope and the rope was through another epoxied iron ring up above. And so just pull that thing right down. Only when I grabbed it, and pulled it. it, it must have laid into some kind of rock wedge and it jammed on the furry first pull. I didn't pull it an inch or two inches and it stuck now and I pulled it again and it got tighter, but it's up around the corner and I've only got one end of the rope. And so now we're in the situation where salvation for us was right at the bottom of this rappel. There's the tent and the food and the stove, everything's right down there. And now we can't get to it because we can't go back up the climb because I'm wearing crampons and it's in the dark and I'm not, I don't have a rope to climb. And plus I've got hypothermia and I couldn't get the rope free. So I kept pulling on the rope, but as the evening, as the morning wore on, I began to go through the last stages of hypothermia. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip all those and come right to the very end when I had this feeling of peace come over me, when I understood that I was going to die and there was nothing I could do about it. That was it. And when I accepted that, this peace settled on me. And I started thinking about my parents and my missing sister and how I was going to die. And it was going to destroy my family because one of the things that happens when someone is vanishes in your life, when they, they vanish, they're gone, is it's like a death, except for there's no community support. There's no memorial service. There's no obituary in the paper. There's no recognition. There's only ongoing mourning. You can't ever move on to the next stage because there is no next stage. So it's this elongation of grief. And I realized that I was dying and my parents who had this terrible grief would really lose another child and it would break them, but I couldn't fix it. So I began to fall asleep and I would fall asleep and I collapsed to the rock and I'd stand back up again and fall asleep and stood back up again. And this last time I stood up, I had tunnel vision which is like a big, huge circle all around me, blackness. 
just out just on the edge of my peripheral vision and it closed in really rapidly like and I, I didn't understand what was going on i was like what is it? everywhere i looked there was this tunnel thing and as i looked to the front it went and as it started to close down i thought i must be falling asleep again but it was unusual i'd never fallen asleep like this before and then it went out boom and when it went out i expected to be asleep but i wasn't i was like Oh, why am I not asleep? How, where, how come I'm not in pain? Why, where'd the mountain go? What, where am I? And in front of me where the mountain had been, there was this opening. And this opening was this enormous blackness. This, but it was blackness that was, that I could see the blackness. It's like when you're in a room and you close, like the room I'm in, if I shut off the lights, I've got a, I'm in a room that has darkening shades. If I, I could I dark, room darkening shades, I shut off the lights, it's pitch black in here. You can't see the darkness. But in this darkness, I could see the darkness. And I was confused. What is this? I, can, I can't I don't understand what's going on. And I don't have any more pain. And as I'm wondering about what's going on, very far in the distance, a, like a cosmos away, there is a star appears, a single star, white star. And the single white star, as it appears, it rushes toward me across this vast expanse. And as it comes toward me, it fills my vision. So it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it covers over the darkness. And as it comes toward me, I'm like, what is this going on here? And it, it communicates to me directly but telepathically, and it says to me, I'm taking you. And I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because I don't, partly because I'd had these other two mystical experiences when I was a kid, and this angelic being was not fearful to me. And I was like, I was resistant though. I was like, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know where you're taking me, but I'm not going anywhere. And so I reached down inside myself and I put up a shield against being taken. And so it rushes toward me and it communicates to me telepathically, I'm taking you. And I'm like, no, I'm not going anywhere. And boom, I'm gone. I just sucks me right into itself. I'm carried right inside of it. And it's like a, an orb of energy. It's a very large orb of energy. And I am, I no longer have a physical form. I have a light body. And my light body is, and I, and these are all metaphors. Okay. It's not made of photons. It's something other than photons, more real than photons, but I have a light body. It's still shaped and looks like a human form. And I'm inside this angelic being, this orb that's communicating to me, comfort, welcome, intelligence, power. I had this in sense that it was the all powerful. And I had this sense that it was also reduced for me, that it was this superposition thing where it was a limited form of this infinite, but the limited form was immensely more powerful than me. And it carried me back up the direction that it came and I could see through it. I could see through it into the darkness. But as I'm looking into the darkness, I can also see me and the angelic orb from the outside. I have a second vision, a, a non-located, non-form, but I can see me inside of it traveling. And, I'm, and my eye, this eye that sees me inside of it is paralleling the track and I can see me. But when I look at the eye outside from the inside of this angelic being, I don't see it. So I can see me looking at this eye, but I can't see the eye and I can see that I'm looking at it and I know that it can't see me. So I am bilocated. I am both this light being, but I'm also this observer. And as we travel back up this route that it had come down and was taking me back to, I was then unfolded like a, an opening of a flower. And suddenly it opened, this angelic being opened up and I came out of it and maybe it expanded into this much larger space or maybe it stayed i don't really know it stayed outside i'm not sure what happened but i was suddenly inside of a much larger darkness that was extended the size of the universe in every direction and it was complete darkness 
but it was also illuminated darkness and I could see vast, a vast distance in every direction simultaneously, like I had 10,000 eyes. But there was a point at which my vision only saw darkness and it was an incredible distance away from me, but there was an impenetrability of, I was not capable of seeing into this infinity, but I was enormous. I was 10,000 times bigger than my human body. And I was a ball of energy. I was a consciousness that was, that my thinking and my knowledge of myself and my physical form, which is a misnomer because I didn't have any physicality at all. I was something other than a thing, but all of me was one. My thinking and my energy, myself, I was one thing. There wasn't like a hand and a brain and my ideas, my hand and my brain were all one thing. And I didn't have any hands and I didn't have a brain. And I was thinking faster than I'd ever thought before in my life. And I was content. I was finally me again. I know myself. This is who I've always been. How did I not know? How did I forget? And as I'm in this form, and as I'm looking in every direction simultaneously, there was this like a waterfall of light that opened in the darkness. The darkness kind of parted. And as it parted, this light showed through, but it was this, I was the size of a mouse and it was the size of the largest waterfall on earth. And it was enormous and it was not next to me. It came toward me. And as it came toward me, I experienced a desire and a passion and a love for it. I can't explain. It was the most beautiful, seductive energy that I only wanted it. And it was several things simultaneously. It was white light and it was 10 million colors. And it wasn't like flicking between light and color. It was light, white light and 10 million colors all at the same time. And these fragments made up the white light and the white light made up the fragments and they were flowing like iridescence, like fish scales, iridescent and glowing. And there was a solidity to the surface of it. And, but it was also translucent. I could see into its depth and I could transparent as well. I could see through it to a deeper darkness and I wanted it and it wanted me. And so as it approached and I moved toward it with thought, I touched it with my being. And when I touched it with my being, I opened. And as I opened, it inflowed. And now I was inflated and surrounded. And all these things happened at once. And I should add this. I was in a place of no thingness. There were no things in this place. There was nothing that had ever been a thing was there. I was not even a thing. I don't know how to describe it, but so I'm in this no thingness that is speaking to me, love, it's expanding inside of me. And I'm also in timelessness. And it wasn't just like being in the now. If you practice meditation, you get to touch into these moments of the now repeatedly or pre repeatedly. This was the now, and it was also time forward and time past and time inverted and time upside down. It was all time beyond the linear time that we talk about. And it was all now. There was no past and no future. It was all in the moment. And so all these things happened to me simultaneously and I've ordered them in a story and I've given them language. I, that's what, so after all this happened, I, my life changed radically. I went to, I didn't take the professional course I was going to take into architecture and graduate school. I went to divinity school. And I studied mysticism in order to try to figure out what had happened to me. So I created language to talk about it. I found language. So there's, I'm in timelessness and I hear my name being called, but it's not Peter. It's the, Peter is, as I understand myself now, is just an expression of this timeline. I am not this thing. I knew myself as an eternal entity, a soul, and I knew as I was being called into being. So this voice 
is inside of me and it surrounds me and I can't see it, but it fills me and it's calling my name into being. It's speaking my soul into existence as it has for eons and eons, always in the now. And it showed me the origin of my soul self. It showed me the, I was like a singular photon in a field, an energetic field of photons that were infinitely deep and wide and broad, but I was separate from them. I was outside of it, but I was superpositioned with it. I was connected to it. I was a portion of this infinite being of light. And it was always calling me into existence. And as it's calling me into existence, I understood the structure of the cosmos because I was connected to the creator. I understood that I was being created. I understood that creator creates everything always in the now and is unlimited power and intellect and kindness and love. And I was, I, as this soul, this fragment of the fullness of the light was also the light, but I was somehow reduction, a reduction of it. And then I saw my, the, my next soul level down where I was a, like a, a big, huge, long tail of life. And in through this long tail of life from my origin, always being called into being to the most recent incarnation, Peter, there were these little, there were lives that I had lived and all of these incarnations that I had lived were all simultaneous to me. And I could see that none of them were the fullness of me. All of them were these tiny little slivers that they were more, more like injected into my oversoul as a needle, as opposed to being the thing itself. And as I was shown this, I could see these lives and I was shown, I asked to be shown to look inside and I could see I was inside a human being and I was on a dirt road and it was hot and there were palm trees and I was with a bunch of people and there were people walking on this road and it was I don't know, a thousand years ago or something. And I was seeing through this person's eyes and they were my eyes because I was inhabiting them. And then I was pulled out of this person and I was put into a, some kind of creature. And I've long thought this creature might've been an animal of some kind, but I don't know whether I was even on earth. I was looking through a different set of eyes, oh, not human eyes. And so everything I saw was shaped differently with different colors. And I had no idea what I was. And I was pulled back out again. And I could see that I'd never been any of these, even though I had lived them and was living them from my point of view. And as all of this is going on, I'm also simultaneously experiencing the, this divine examination of my most recent human life, where I can see I'm being called into being, I still have the same experience of always being called into being, but also I see my human life and I see that I'm being seen and that there is nothing that I had done in my, as Peter, that was unseen. Every single aspect of me was brilliantly illuminated, no dark corners to hide anything. And as I was seeing into my own dark corners, I was, went through a life review and my life review was a hell that I had created for myself as I had in my life given away pain to people intentionally. And it, it was a chronological experience of being inside of every single person and every single time that I hurt every single person being inside of them and seeing, experiencing the pain that I had given them from their emotional, psychological, chemical, point of view. Simultaneously, I was also inside of my human self, experiencing all of the pain that I gave them from my point of view, why I gave it to them, what I was feeling, how I wanted them to hurt. And the disproportion between these two things, my, my weak and human willful intention to cause suffering, and the, which was teeny, teeny, tiny, but the suffering I caused each time was ginormous and that all the pain that I had given away had karmically attached to me and that it was my pain. And I understood that the divine 
lived inside of me and experienced all of this with me. That's why there were no hidden spots. That's why you could see everything about me. And it was true for everyone who's, who suffered the pain that I gave them. The divine is inside of them as well. And so knows everything. And as I'm going through this, I realized that the divine, because I had seen the infinity, I had seen the edge of infinity, the edge of the power of the divine, the almighty, non-gendered, no religion, immensity beyond human capacity for understanding, immeasurably pure, immeasurably unlimited. And I could see my own limitation, my own impurity was showing me my human self. And I was ashamed, not for what I had done, because it also showed me that I was only doing what humans do. This is how humans are. It's You don't blame the wolf for killing the lamb when it's in the nature of the wolf to kill the lamb. It's just what it is. And human beings, it showed me all humanity and that human beings were just this way. It's the way that we're designed. And therefore, there's this radical equality among all human beings because I could see my own limitation in comparison to the unlimited. In my shame, I felt shame. And I felt shame and guilt, not because of what I had done, which was terrible, not terrible things, but I had hurt people. But the real pain came in the comparison to the purity and the unlimited nature of the divine. So simultaneously, I saw the radical equality of all humanity and our brokenness toward each other, which in my own life now is translated into, don't judge, least you be judged to put it in Christian language, it's, I see the other human as broken as me, no matter who they are. And even if they're enemies in my life, and I, I've lived a professional life here, you live long enough, people don't like you, no matter what you do, because you cross them the wrong way. And I, even in the people who were out to get me, I could only see light inside them. doesn't mean I, I liked what they were doing to me, but I couldn't help but see the light. So I see this radical equality of all of humanity. I saw this, my own limitation, and I went into this hell of, I felt this separation from the unlimited. But meanwhile, this voice was saying to me the entire time, welcome, I love you, I have always loved you, I have always known you, I have always loved you as you are, even as you did all of these things, I love you as you are. And as I began to listen with the ear of my heart through the lens of love, all the love I had given away in my life, all the love that I had accepted in my life, all was with me as well. And as I listened with my heart, or the ear of my heart, and heard this voice of mercy and forgiveness, I was, I turned toward it because it's, it was like being a crab on the beach as a hundred foot tidal wave sucks you right out and crashes down. And there was no like, do I swim and survive? Or do I just, or it's just going to crash over me? The light was so powerful. The love was so powerful that it crashed over me and I had no resistance to it. Not that I wanted resistance to it, but the, but it was so overwhelmingly powerful that I didn't deserve its love and it came anyway. And as I turned toward it and I made this I don't want to say choice to turn toward it because it was, I couldn't not turn toward it. It was too powerful. Like that tidal wave, as I turned toward it, I was inflated. And as I am suddenly I turned toward it, and now my soul self inflates and inflates and inflates, and I get bigger and bigger and bigger, and I'm filled with beauty and love and truth, bliss, joy, adoration, understanding, compassion, knowledge, wisdom, mathematical comprehension, just brilliance, awe, and wonder. And I was expanded to the point of almost being folded back into the infinity itself. I came to this very edge where one more drop of it and I would have become awareness itself again. So I entered into this state of union where I saw the truth of myself as a soul. And then I was deflated and I was somehow able to remember my recent life as Peter and I could see my parents and I asked about their suffering. I said, because this voice is saying, come home, come home. It's time for you to come home. You've seen all this stuff now. Come home to me. And I said, what about my folks? They're, 
you're going to suffer. And as I had this thought, I was swept across heaven. Now, heaven is not this, for my, in my experience, it's this no thingness. And it's, it is not separate from this voice that's right next to me and inside of me. It is the, all of this. The divine is all of this. And it sweeps me across itself and it pokes my head out. It pokes my head out through the edge of heaven into our universe. And, but I don't have a head, remember. I am a non-thing. And so I have, a, I have an awareness outside of heaven while 99% of me is still embodied inside the divine. But I can see I'm being shown the universe. And as I'm being shown the universe, I see all of our universe. I see all of the galaxies up and down and just billions of galaxies and billions of stars and the space between them. And my vision is directed to the origin. And so I'm looking at the origin of our universe. And the origin of our universe is this light that is pervading everything. So as, this, as there's a darkness that I can't see into, but there's this light that's coming out of it and creating all matter. And as it creates all this matter, all of these galaxies, it is woven through all of it. There is light. I can see light inside all of it. The light is emanating from the darkness and there's no part of the universe that is not made of this. It's not just stars and planets. It's all of the material that's in between. It's the dark matter and the dark energy. All of it's made of this divine light. And as it's showing me this, it's also showing me other universes, universe after universe. It's like always unfolding, even as it's powering our universe, it's unfolding more and more. And it's all of it is, all of these universes and our universes are just filled with the love that is incomprehensible. It's the whole thing is just all this love that creates all of it. And all of this love that creates all of these universes is aimed right at me. It's like all of this love is aimed right at me and I am the most beloved. And as I am the most beloved, it says to me, I, in the way that I love you now, I have always loved you. All is, was, and shall be well because of my love. And my love is as large as the universe, larger than the universes. And I am, I am in bliss. And as this is, as I'm experiencing this, my vision is sh shifted back to earth. And I down to our galaxy, down our solar system, and I can see Earth like a hologram. And I see 7 billion people on it all at once, and not like A to B to C to D. I can see everything all at once. And inside of every, and it's dark, it's live time. So it's night on half the planet and daylight on half the planet. And there are ships at sea and airplanes in the sky, and babies being born and wars being waged and bank robberies and kind acts. Every, I can see everything. And inside of every single human being, there is this golden fleck of light. And this golden fleck of light is inside of every, the heart of every human being. And nobody can see it because it's all, the whole planet is covered with this dense fog. And I can see it. I see this, that everybody is as beloved as me. So this experience of this belovedness, that I was the most beloved in the whole universe, is the truth of every single person. That all of us are the most beloved. And I see this as clearly as, as I understand my own self. And as I see this, I zoom in to one person. I, I see this ship in the middle of the Atlantic, but I like zoom inside and I zoom down and I'm inside this ship and I'm on this deck and I'm inside the ship and there's a guy there and this guy, I can see this light inside his chest. He didn't see me. He's just doing, he's dressed in khaki clothes and doing his job, whatever it was. But I see inside him the very thing that's inside of me and then I'm pulled back out again. And as I'm pulled back out again, I understand that all is well and has been well and will be well. And that because of this immense love, nothing and no one is ever lost. There's no lost. The divine is all there is. And the divine does not lose itself. And so I say, no. And so it shows me my parents' faces. And suddenly I see my mom and my dad. And all of the suffering that they had endured up until that day. And I, it's not like I see their pain. And then I see these two parallel lives. I see mom and dad on this track and mom and dad on this track. And on track A, I 
am not there. I die. And I see immense brokenness. Like the suffering they have now is 10 times worse. And then I see this other track, track B, and I go back. And I see they still have immense suffering, but not 10 times the amount had I died and they lost a son. And then I see their deaths, not how they die, but what happens to them after they die. And after they die, they're just like me. Most beloved, no pain, all healing, all wholeness, all wellness, of all repaired. And the voice says, no matter what you choose, all's well, pick. And so I think to myself, timelessness, I'm beloved. I say, if I go back to help them not suffer this loss of a second child, can I come back here to this bliss of paradise? And the voice says, yes, you can come back here. It's time for you to come home. But if you choose, you can go back and come back here. I say, I choose to live my life. And it says, you won't live your life and flicks me out. And off I go. And now I'm once again encased inside this angelic being, and I'm getting denser and denser. I'm being flown out of heaven. And as I'm being flown out of heaven, I see this beam of white light emitting from heaven, this big, huge, like big, huge laser beam of white light. And it's next to me and I'm above it and I'm being flown. And in front of me, it goes into the space and then there are a million doors and it's in the center of these million doors and all of these million doors are darker and darker till they get to the edge but brilliantly illuminated the doors closer to the middle and all of them are lives they're all timelines and the voice says to me choose light but choose and i have to choose which door i'm going to go in to get back to this body and i choose light but I choose self too. I think to myself, I know that I'm being sent back as a messenger and I choose, how can I be a messenger of light unless I have flaw, unless I'm a human being like everybody else. I, and I want to be creative and I want to be a little bit of a bohemian and I want to be this and that and the other thing. And I, and so I choose a door in an instant with these very rapid thoughts and it's close to the light but it's not in the direct beam, it's off to the side. And as soon as I make this choice, I'm in that door. And as I'm in, in this door and I'm traveling down this tunnel, still inside this angelic being, there are a million doors inside this tunnel. And every one of these doors is a choice to make. I can see all the choices and all of these doors lead to all the other tunnels. And I can see all of that. And then I get to the end of my tunnel and there's my body dangling on the cliff. And I'm harnessed in and there's the body, only it's not me. I don't know. There's some body there and it's harnessed in and it's hanging off the cliff. And then I am taken out of this angelic being and stabbed into the center of the, my, this body's chest and screwed in painfully. And it opens and I'm poor, shoved, stuffed inside. And now I'm inside this physical form and there's a, there's this little opening and I can see out this little opening that's in the heart of this and I can see the white light going back into heaven. I can see the darkness. I can see the angelic being, and then it just closes. And now, ah, I'm imprisoned. I'm, in, I'm imprisoned and I'm exiled. And my, the brain, that's because that's not me, the brain comes back online, whirs in up, boots up again, and then all this flash of pain, this physical pain that I didn't understand. I was like, what is this painful thing that I don't understand anymore? Because when I was dead, pain was forgotten. It was like, didn't exist. And now I'm in this painful body and I'm beginning to hear things and sound comes back and they're screaming and yelling and I'm like, it resolves into language. And I hear, don't die. And this thing is jostling. And I open the eyes and there's this face looking at me, screaming and yelling at me, don't die, don't die. And it's like, sees my eyes are open. You're not dead. You're, I thought you were dead. You, you were dead. You, I thought you were dead. And he pulls me up and he's yelling at me and screaming at me. And I don't know, I don't know who I am. I don't know where I am. I don't know who he is. I'm completely lost. And as he's talking to me, the brain sort of warms up and I was like, oh, I'm ice climbing and this is Tim and I'm Peter and what is going, who am I? What is this thing I'm stuck inside of? And now I'm two people. I'm the one that he, the human being, but I am this other entity 
occupying the human being. And at some point he's pulled the rope and I pull the rope and it comes free and we descend and we self-treat in the tent for hypothermia and frostbite. And the story goes on from there. I, it was, we got, we spent a little time in jail. We totaled the car, all of this on the way home, just all terrible things happened. I ended up with a stutter and I was a new person. I was not the same person I was before and I've never been since I came back. I feel like I, an alien inhabiting a life form. I was mostly in heaven and I was looking out these eyes and I was living inside this crude machine that I was imprisoned inside of a and everything from that point on, I was an entirely an am different person. That's an astounding story, Peter. So how long was it before you felt like you were able to be willing to share that story with other people, say to your friend, Tim, or any of your family? I never told him. I never told anybody. I didn't tell him. I told my wife on the morning after we got married, but I kept it a secret for 20 years. I didn't tell anybody because mm -hmm. I knew enough that I knew enough that I didn't want to be mistaken to be insane. And so I masked, I changed my career. My sister was in graduate school in architecture at this point. My dad had a firm outside of Boston and was a pretty fancy guy. And I was going to be an architect my whole life, my whole life. I was going to be an architect. I was pushing a pencil at the drafting board and why are you being an English major? How's that going to help you? I was like, I'll write about it and doing drafting for my dad and stuff my whole life and working in construction. So we had a hammer all the summers, cutting a board and building houses so I could learn it from the inside out, all that stuff. And then suddenly I came home and uh, I'm not doing that. And so I went to divinity school because I didn't know what to do. I needed to study mysticism and I, I'd had enough because I was an English major. I'd read about Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, the romantics and the transcendentalists mm -hmm. who were spiritual people. And so I knew about the Upanishads and the Vedas through those folks. And so I decided that I had to, that I needed to find a peer group, but I needed to do it in such a way that I didn't, that nobody would know that I was doing this. So I went to divinity, I went to Yale Divinity School and I studied mysticism and I learned contemplation techniques and came across Pramahansa Yogananda and the Yoga Sutras by Pantajali. And I incorporated Kriya Yoga into my meditation life. And I practiced Hatha Yoga and Kriya Yoga in combination. And I did that on the down low. People knew that I was practicing because they could see me standing on my head, but they didn't know what I was doing with my breath and my mind. I. I chose to, I was in such despair. I was in darkness, living in this hell hole of beauty. There's a lot of beauty here and a lot of good things, but it's like hell compared to heaven and full of suffering and pain. And I, all I wanted to do was go back. And I discovered in my studies that there's a long history of mystics in the world. And some of them were high masters and they had techniques of breath and mental focus that reconnected them or connected them to the divine presence. And so I went in pursuit of that and I kept that a secret. So I, I didn't tell, I didn't tell anybody. I hid inside the church. I got talked into becoming a minister. I was going to go for a graduate degree and study mysticism for a doctorate. But I, but the Dean of students who let me do this three-year independent study at Yale as my mentor, who I also didn't tell <laughs> anything about what was going, really going on. She talked me into becoming a minister and I decided that I could hide inside the church. And so I hid inside the church for 20 years and continued my studies. I read all of the Nag Hammadi texts and all the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I did a lot of research and I dove deep into my practice. I even had in my church contract that they had to let me meditate and do yoga. And they're like, why are you doing this? I'm like, I don't, you don't let me do this. I can't do the job. And when I did a lot of social services, helped a lot of people. But it wasn't, there was this huge embezzlement in this church that I was serving. And it was after that embezzlement, after they tried to destroy my career, because we, we were finding out the truth and there people went to prison. So they tried to ruin me. But when it was all over, I finally decided it was time to tell the congregation in the town why I was able to put up with all the terrible things they did to me for all the years that they did, because they, the deacons asked me, you must have had a lot of faith to put up with all that we put you through. And I was like, I don't have any faith at all. I am not a believer. I don't believe in any of this stuff. I know 
what the divine is. I know that I am beloved. I know it is my beloved. And so that's where my strength comes from. So it, even though I kept it a secret and didn't tell anybody, it was pretty obvious to everybody that I was some kind of eccentric. <laughs> it's like I was making choices and doing things that other people just wouldn't do, certainly not clergy people. Yeah, that's pretty common. There's a lot of people that one, once they've had their negative experience, they know what they know and they know that it's going to be odd or eccentric to many people and they just don't care. And it's really the only way you can deal with it, I think. So I assume that you told your wife first and then it was the congregation. I told my wife the day after we got married mm. when I was still in divinity school. And then I told the congregation 18 years later. And then I didn't tell anybody in between. I told one guy mm. too. I told my best friend. And I told this guy who saw this thing happen, one of those after effects that I had to explain to him because it was too crazy. And he's like, what's that? Like, okay, I got to tell you what happened. And so I told the congregation after 20 years. And then after I did this in my town, that week, six people came up to me. The woman who owns the fish fry, the woman who is the physical therapist, the, the woman who's a nurse and all the three or four other people in there, they whispered to me, we heard what happened to you. That happened to me too. Don't tell anybody. And because there was all this shame, this was back in 20 years ago now, when near-death experience was still unknown. And I was now out of the closet with it, and which freed me because I didn't have to hide it anymore. I was walking around masking all the time, mm. pretending, pretending I was a believer. That was the whole that was like the fundamental thing of the job. If you got to be a minister, you got to be a believer, but I'm not a believer. I was like, okay, so I don't have to hide that anymore. And then I got recruited into television and I started working on local broadcast on two stations all across our state and part of another state. And I started working nationally out in New York City. And those people, the TV people I was working with there, found out about my NDE because I got drunk one night and I told them. We were all out at this party and we're all drinking. I'm like, and then this thing happened to me. I was like, oh God. And they talked me into writing a book and becoming public about it. And that was that I don't have one of the after effects of my near death experience is I'm pretty fearless about, I know where I'm from. I know where I'm going. You can't kill me. I've been held at gunpoint. I've been shot at. There's been, I've been involved in arsons and murders and all sorts of crazy stuff in my ministry. That's what I mean. When eccentric stuff, I was mm. like doing things that I didn't mean to do, but I found myself in the middle of. And, but coming out of the closet back in 2015, risking ridicule and my career, I, I was nervous about that, but I did it anyway. Because every, because I can't help but trust. I can't, I'll, it's trust it with a capital T. All I do is trust this divine, everything that I do. Strip away myself, trust the divine's presence. I try to stand in the crystal stream. I try to get out of the way and clear out the boulders that are in the way of the flow and let it be what it is so that I can be with it as I am. And so I came out and then, so I'm in the hospital bed. I had in 2015, I was running 5K every day. And what the hell? I don't feel so great. And the next day, I go to yoga class and I'm in yoga class. And I was like, oh, I don't feel good. And I have a heart attack. I have a heart attack in class. I die in the ambulance on the way. And I choose to come back again, this time for my granddaughter. And so I was in, and I had a lot of damage. I live very far, I live in a rural area. And I live an hour and a half away from the catheterization lab. And by the time I even left the local urgent care center to get in the ambulance to go to the catheterization lab, my golden hour was up. Now you only get one hour before damage starts setting in. And so the doc had told my family that I was going to die on the way. And there was nothing to be done. And I did. And I chose to come back for my granddaughter this time. And then I'm in the hospital bed. And the next day, I, a bunch of my friends are there and my wife and my kids. And I was like, I died yesterday. And, and then the TV station was purchased by another corporation and my job got canceled. They told me, you've got a year and your job, you're done. We're, we're, and the show that I was on, okay, the other thing about this show, it was 91 years old when it ended. I was the fifth guy and it started on AM radio and it, it, was, a, it was an institution 
in Northern New England, where I live, beloved institution. And I had two minutes every morning on these two stations to tell an inspirational story of love and hope, which I did thousands of times, new stories. And then my job was they're like, it's over. And now I'm a new person again. Every time I have a mystical experience, a near death experience, I become back a different person, more intensely my true self. And so after this second NDE that had been, I don't know, pre prepped, I was prepped for it by a series of previous mystical experiences in between these two major things. And I decided I was finally all in and I was just going to spend the rest of my life working. I'd already been spending my life working for God, for the Allah, for the, for Brahman, whatever you want to call it. But now I'm going to do it in a very public way. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm trying my best to get other near death experiencers to have the courage to tell somebody or to talk about it in public because there are tens of millions of us because after cardiac care came online in the 1960s and they started resuscitating people in ur urgent care centers and hospitals and surgeries and ambulances. And now at corporations, they got paddles and corporations and in schools, there are tens of millions of Americans there are estimated 400 million near death experiences worldwide. And we are a phenomenon. And we're quiet because we, nobody wants to tell anybody, nobody wants to be, oh, he's crazy, man. This guy is, he's, he's, he sounds like a kook, which is why I kept it a secret because I come from a very educated, highly intellectual family that is, they were faithful people. They all went to church, but none of them, they, they I knew that it was crazy talk. So I kept my mouth shut until I couldn't keep it shut anymore. And now there are so many books and movies and podcasts and articles. I haven't seen the latest Marvel movie with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, but apparently Rocket has a near-death experience. I'm going to see this movie because apparently this raccoon character, he has an NDE. I probably just ruined that for all of you. But, but it's becoming, I want to see it talked about in the public square, which is why I'm doing it in the public square. Because the more of us that talk about it, the more it gets normalized. And the more it gets normalized, the more we can talk about other people's mystical experiences. Because it's not just end of years. All sorts of people have mystical experiences. They have visitations from the dead. That Jesus shows up for them. Buddha shows up. There's a divine being. They have a transformative mystical experience that sets them on a new course in their life. And they keep it a secret because it's a shameful thing. Because it's not rational. And I want it to be spoken of in the public square because... I think that we have an opportunity for the first time in the history of the planet to nudge humanity in a new way. They've always been near-death experiencers. There's the Bible has a, at least five, seven, eight of them, if you count Jesus, maybe even nine, if you count him, all people being raised from the dead. They've always been near-death experiencers, but now we're hundreds of millions of us. We have an opportunity to be influential. And the two words, there was this study that was a whole series of essays were written two years ago for a million dollars in prizes hosted by the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies. And the grand prize winner was a, like a half a billion dollars. But in one of these essays that I read, the research project showed that 70% of all near-death experiencers favor two words about their experience, love and light. 70%, no matter who they are. And this is a phenomenal non-sectarian change. It doesn't have anything to do with religion. It has to do with the transformation of individual human hearts expressed in their own lives. And in, in, if there are 400 million of us in 400 million different ways, because there are 400 million different DNA packages by the way, we share 99% of our DNA, by the way. So we're, we are so much more alike than we are separate. This 1% is what separates us. But there are 400 million near-death experiencers, all with their individual experience, all knowing at the very least that consciousness doesn't arise in the body, that it inhabits the body. When I first started this channel, I just when I saw one of these interviews, I thought, oh, that's what I need to do. I didn't really have an inkling of why. I just knew that's what I needed to do. And it's interesting, every conversation I have, and yours is no exception, is that I get a bit more of an inkling of why it's so important. 
I think it's really important that people get to, at the very least, tell their story and that it becomes just part of our sort of way of being. I had an orthopedic surgeon who I interviewed last week and he was saying how they're now starting to introduce the near-death experiences and what happens to people in nursing courses, like in the more advanced nursing courses, after they've done their usual medical school, they can go and do an add-on and it's to teach people about near-death experiences because it's becoming so prevalent. Oh, wow. That's good news. Yeah, which is a step in the right direction. Yeah, because in the old days, they'd be like, oh, honey, that's not real. <laughs> yeah, that was just it. There was an hallucination. It was your brain. I think when Eben Alexander, the neuroscientist, when he wrote his mm. book, it became much harder to argue that this is an hallucination because your brain is not functioning. Right. How can you have memories if it's not functioning? It can't be that the seat of the consciousness is in the brain. It has to be something outside of that. Yeah. I wanted to ask, I know we've, been, <laughs> we've covered a lot of ground and it's been amazing. The mystical experiences that you had when you were small, if you could just touch on those, what they were about. Unexpected, that's the first thing, and undeserved. I didn't do anything. It just happened. And so I was, the first one, I was five years old and I was waiting for my sisters to come back from school. And I was a morning kindergarten class. Uh, it was half day kindergarten. I climbed a little tiny maple tree in my side yard, waiting for my sisters, going to surprise them when I got off the bus. And it was a, an autumn day and all the leaves were these two colors. It was a maple tree. I don't know if you have sugar maple trees down in Australia but they they get very colorful in the autumn. But before they turn color, they are these vibrant two-tone. The top of the leaf is one color, bottom of the leaf is another color. And the wind was blowing and it was flipping these leaves. And I got into this mesmeric state as I watched at five years old. And as I'm in this mesmeric state, just watching these flipping leaves, I this roar happened. And behind me, this very loud, when I was a kid, I talked about it as like a, a whole bunch of trumpets blowing behind me. Brah. And as it blew behind me, it entered into me and it grabbed me and it pulled me out of myself. And I was stretched up. I was inside the same angelic being and I was pulled up out of myself and I could see my human self. And I was being, and I was way above it, right, right through the atmosphere. And then I was inside of this angelic being. And I could still, down this very tiny, thin cord, see my human self sitting in the tree a million miles away from me. But I was inside of this transparent orb in this great darkness. And inside this transparent orb, I had a body of light. And I'm in this body of light. And there is like a countertop appears, a counter in front of me. And then it's a barrier of some kind. And the orb opens up and in pours a portion of the divine. And this portion of the divine is morphing, changing through all of these different shapes at, at, at an incredible rate of speed. Just change. But consistently saying to me, you have a deal with me and showing me itself. And then it pulled me out of this orb and into the darkness. And in the darkness, I saw a glimpse of infinity of the size of the divine. I saw myself as pre-existent and then I was back inside the orb and I, and it said to me, you have a, this is me, Peter, making language for what happened. You have a contract with me. You work for me. You, you work for me. You're mine. You work for me. And I was like, I work for you. I had that deal. I'm, that's our deal. Our deal is in this lifetime, I work for you. And then I'm back in my body again. And I'm like, what? And I jump out of the tree and I run in the house because I'm a five-year-old kid going to Greek, Greek school and the Catholic church. And I run in the house and I say to my mom, I'm going to be a priest. God talked to me. And I got in trouble because I was not supposed to be in the house because the baby was sleeping and I got kicked out and I had to dust the house and all this kind of stuff. It was punishment and because I broke the rules and I realized that I should keep my mouth shut about this kind of thing. And I didn't understand it at all, but I, my mom and my dad would tell me that I was, I was a boy, all right? I did boy things, picked on my sisters and hurt my brother and all this kind of boy stuff. And, but my mom and my dad said that I was also had a lot of compassion that they, the other kids didn't have. And I think it came from this. And then about a year later, when I was six, 
the day that my dog, my dad accidentally ran over my dog and killed him and I saw it happen and it was tragic and I was emotionally and my parents had got me this dog because the, it's a long story. I have this special dog. And so that night, as I cried myself to sleep, I heard my name being called and I sat up in bed and I hear this voice that it's not my mom and my dad, it's not my sister, it's not my grandparents. I don't know who it is, but I know the voice and it's filled with love. It's just calling my name. And so I sit up in bed and it's calling my name and calling my name. It's calling, come to me. And I look down and my body is still asleep curled up on the bed with the pillow. And I looked down like, what's that? Is that me? And I'm me. And I looked down at my feet and my body and I've got this ethereal body again. And I can see in the room and my baby brother's got his crib in the room and it's dark in the room, but the whole thing is like a sepia tone. Everything is this copper illumination, but if the illumination's not coming from the outside, it's coming from inside of everything. And it says, come to me, come to me. And so I stand up and my feet aren't on the floor. I'm floating above the floor. Come to me. And I get to the door and it's most, it's just like love. I hear this love and it's voice, love, love. And the door's kind of shut. And it, it says, come to me, come to me. And I reach for the knob and my hand goes through the knob. And it says, nah, just walk through the door. You don't need a knob. And so I walk through the door and I pass through the solid door. And at the top of the stairs, I look down the stairs. And there was a landing, which the stairs came down and angled at a 90 degree. And in the 90 degree angle, there was a little elephant that filled the landing. And this elephant was all dressed in like sparkly Indian elephant clothes. And, but I, I, I was a Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Irish kid from Boston. I didn't know nothing about Hinduism. And there's this elephant and its eyes are black and it's speaking to me inside my head. And it's telepathically communicating to me and it's waving me down with its trunk and I float company and I go down and I'm eye to eye with this. I'm like a six year old kid and my eyes are at the same level and I'm looking in one of the eyes and I shrink and I fly inside the eye, pass through and into the eye and I'm into this darkness again, but this darkness is, it's filled with wisdom and knowledge and comfort. And I see a glimpse of myself and infinity and then I'm pulled back out again. And I'm in front of the little elephant and it says, go down the stairs and go outside. And I'm like, I can't do that. My mom and dad told me never go outside at night. It's no go. And so it motions with its trunk down the stairs. And so I float down the stairs and I go through the front door and out into the road. It's upstairs in the hallway still on the stairs, but it's also with me. So it's in two places at once. And it's speaking to me and it says, look up, look up. So I look up and there's this star filled sky. And this, and as I look at all these stars, suddenly I shoot toward them all. And as I shoot toward them all, they all open up and I see infinity inside them. I see the origin of them all and it frightens me. It's too much for me. It's too big and too overwhelming. And as soon as this happens, I'm back in my body again in the bed. And I sit up and it's dark in the room and, um, and I spend, I don't know, an hour searching the house, even in the dark, scary, spider-ridden cellar where I never, ever go. I even went looking down there for the elephant. And I, it wasn't until I was much, much older, after my first NDE, that looking back over my shoulder of my life, I saw this pattern. Because there was another one that happened, there were two that happened the year before I died. I haven't even told you about it. Well, back when I was backpacking on the Appalachian Trail the year before, as I look back from my NDE, I see this pattern that set me up for this life that I'm living. And I got to choose, I get to choose now. I have decision-making capacity now, but I made my real choice before I was even born. And I've been living with that ever since. And I've had to live into that because I've not always enjoyed it and I've not always liked the choices that I made. It's not been an easy thing. Peter, how can people learn more about the work that you do and if they wanted to get in touch or ask a question, it's the best way to do that? I'm at peterpanagor.love. You can email me at peterpanagor.love. I specialize in helping people who've had mystical experiences integrate. People who've had near-death experiences integrate, help them understand what they've gone through. I've had a lot of mystical experiences. I didn't make them happen. They happened to me. And there's been a lot of them. And so I have lots of unusual experience that people have found helpful. 
I run a YouTube channel, Not Church. Not Church is about mysticism. And I run a global group on Sundays on Zoom for people from all over the world, including Australia, where we talk about the things that you can't talk about in public about your mystical life. Excellent. And do you have any last message for people before we wrap the interview up? Sure. All you need is love. That's all you need. That's it. All has been well and will be well. And you'll find out for yourself the moment that you die. It's not darkness, it's light. Trust it. Peter, thank you for being the guest on my show. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks, Rod.